Good morning. Glad to have you uh, here with us. Glad you've chosen to worship with us at North Point. It's good to see you guys. Um, I want to start off this morning, if it's all right, just by diving right into the text. Um, I have really wrestled with this passage over the last few weeks. Um, I've probably rewritten this message three or four times. <laughs> uh, and so as we dive into this, I would ask for your grace for me. If it feels a little rough around the edges in certain spots, that's not intentional. <laughs> Uh, so I'd ask for your grace. Maybe you can say a short prayer for me. Um, and I wrestle with this because God has some amazing stuff for us in his word today. And I desperately do not want to get in the way of that. Um, I just want God's word to speak. So we're gonna read the passage that we're at in Colossians. And then I'm gonna tell you where I thought we were going when I first read the passage and where the Holy Spirit has corrected me and shifted our focus um, we're in now the second chapter in Colossians. We've worked our way all the way through the first chapter of Colossians and to the first few verses last week. And so we're gonna start in Colossians chapter two, starting at verse six. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead." And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So I gotta be honest, as I read that the first time, the passage, or the verse in this passage that stuck out to me the most, and the verse that I was most looking forward to discussing with you was verse eight. Don't be taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit. And as I read that the first time, my heart began to race, because I was very much looking forward to having a, a false teacher bash fest with you guys this morning. But thankfully, both for you and for me, the Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart. And as I read through that passage again, I heard the Holy Spirit say, Mark, if that is your takeaway from Colossians 2, you are missing me. So I read back through it again and again and again and I dug out some Bible commentaries and I talked about this passage with friends and don't get me wrong, there is some serious false teacher bashing going on from Paul here, but it does not at all look like what I thought it was going to look like. So if the main point here is not to tear down false teaching, what is Paul's main point in these nine verses? Let me see if I can show you. We're gonna go through rapid fire each verse. Verse six, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Who's the him? Jesus. Verse seven, be rooted and built up in him. Who's him? Jesus. See to it that no one takes you captive according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Jesus. Verse nine, for in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Verse 10, you have been filled in Jesus. Verse 11, in Jesus, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Verse 12, having been buried with Jesus in baptism in which you were also raised with Jesus through faith. Verse 13, you were dead and God made you alive together with Jesus. Verse 14 is the only verse that doesn't have a direct mention mention of Jesus by name, but what is mentioned is the cross. Who died for you on the cross? In verse 15, God disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Jesus Christ. Over and over and over again, it feels like Paul smacks us in the face with this constant reminder. What is it all about? Jesus Christ, who saved us? Jesus Christ. How are we saved? Jesus Christ. How do we know that to be true? Jesus Christ. And who gets all the glory? Jesus Christ. And Paul gives us this strong, constant, and clear affirmation of Jesus Christ as both Savior and Lord because that is the focus that keeps us away from false teaching. You see, Paul understands that when it comes to truth and false truth, 
that there's obviously a lot more false truth than there is the truth, because there's only one the truth, right? But if you start to make false truths your main focus, inevitably, you take your sight off of the truth. And what Paul is saying here is echoed by this small quote from one of my favorite movies. If you've ever seen The Patriot, you know what I'm talking about. And of course, I have to bring up The Patriot. We just came out of July 4. It's a great Revolutionary War movie. You have to watch it. And there's a quote in that movie that my family and I used to say to each other all the time. The quote is this, aim small, miss small. See, the main character gives that advice to his sons as they aim their weapons. Because if you aim your weapon at a target, if you just aim down the range at a target, you can often miss by going to the right or the left because you're just generally aiming at the target. But if you narrow your focus to something smaller, like the bullseye, you might not hit the bullseye directly, but you'll probably end up in that area. And so what Paul is teaching us here is that same concept, aim small, miss small. If our target is to avoid all false teaching, then you've got a pretty big target. But if we learn to narrow our focus and narrow our aim to what Paul is showing here, to Jesus, then that's where we're gonna end up. So as we go through these verses, we're gonna try and uncover how Paul narrows our focus to Jesus and away from false gospels. So we start in Colossians 2, 6, where Paul says that followers of Jesus are meant to walk in Jesus just as they received Jesus. And so we must ask the logical question from Colossians 2, 6. How did we receive Jesus? Do we receive Jesus by being good enough, by deserving it, by meriting the gift of Jesus? No. We receive Jesus not by good works, but by faith. And so to walk in Christ, just as you received Christ, is to walk in and by faith. And the result of you walking in faith, walking in trust to Jesus, is that you will be rooted and built up and established. And this is where it gets interesting in the Greek. In the Greek, the words for rooted, built up, and established are verbs. And when we think of verbs, we think, okay, I do that. I root myself. I build myself up. I establish myself. But the Greek is interesting because those are all passive verbs. And so when you come across a passive verb, it means that someone else is doing the action for you. So think of it like a garden. In a garden, you know that we require a proper balance of sunlight and water and good soil in order to grow and thrive. And we are the crop in this garden that requires these elements in order to grow and thrive. And we know that for the tomato plant, if you, I, I don't have a green thumb, I'm not a gardener. I barely have thumbs as it is, okay? I don't garden, so gardeners can correct me afterwards. But in the garden, does the tomato plant provide its own sun? No. Does the tomato plant provide its own rain? No. Those elements are provided for it, and as a result, growth occurs. And that is how God works in your life, that God brings these elements to you. God roots you. God builds you up. God establishes you. And because God is working in your life, then out of the overflow of God's work, you live a life that is pleasing to God. And a symptom of that that Paul points out is that you abound in thankfulness. Think of the people in your life that are closest to Jesus and how thankful they are constantly. That's a symptom of God working. And let me get to Colossians 2.8, and this is the verse that I thought was going to be the driving force behind this message. But as we look at this verse, Paul doesn't tell us what the false teaching was. We've talked previously about how it might have been something like Gnosticism, that false teaching that emphasized secret knowledge, the more you know, the holier you become. But really, Paul doesn't say, he just gives us some small hints. He says that it was an empty or worthless philosophy and deceit, that it was according to tradition and demonic spirits. But his main emphasis comes at the end of the verse where he says that this teaching is false because it's not according to Christ. Think of it like trying to spot a, a counterfeit bill. Did you know that when federal agents are trained to spot counterfeit bills, they are not trained by examining false bills? Their education is entrenched so deeply into the real currency that when they come across a counterfeit, it becomes obvious to them. They can see that it's missing certain markers or that the texture feels different than it should or that it doesn't appear properly under these lighting conditions. And so the same is meant to be true for us with Jesus, 
that we are so deeply entrenched in Jesus and all that he is that when we come across a fraud, it becomes obvious to us. When we come across something that doesn't line up with God's word about Christ, we know it's counterfeit. And so Paul, rather than digging deeper into what this false teaching is, chooses instead to refocus our attention on the truth of Jesus Christ. Aim small, miss small. And so that's what we're gonna keep doing today. So Colossians 2, 9, things get interesting here because Paul starts to paint a picture for his audience. Using certain language that would be key words for them, Paul begins to paint this picture of Jesus as this fulfilled promise from the Old Testament. And we'll examine the language that Paul uses, but it becomes clear that Paul is saying that Jesus is the better fulfillment of the temple. You see, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, the temple was the dwelling place of God. This is where God would focus and limit his presence. And within the temple, he would even further restrict his presence to a place called the Holy of Holies. It was this restricted, sectioned off part of the temple. And so now, Paul says that God's fullness of deity doesn't dwell in the building, it dwells bodily. So try to picture how radical this would have been for Paul's Jewish audience, where all they've known about God is that God restricts his presence to the temple. And now Paul says, no, God's fullness of deity dwells in the person of Jesus. Paul is saying that Jesus is the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was this sectioned off part of the temple that would literally kill people if they entered into it unclean. Just by walking into the room if you didn't meet the certain criteria, you would just die. They would actually tie a rope around the priest because if the priest walked in and was unclean, he would just die. And you couldn't go in to collect the body because you would die. So they tied a rope around their waist because if they died, you just pull them out. And so that incredibly powerful place in the temple that housed the full holiness of God no longer rests in the building that rests in Jesus. And not only is Jesus the perfect filling of God's presence, but God has now moved that from the building to filling his people directly. That's what we experience today. God's presence is here, not because we're in the building, but because we are in the building. Does that distinction make sense? God's presence is in his people. And to continue to emphasize that Jesus is the fulfilled promise of the temple, Paul says that you, as the church, you are circumcised by a circumcision made without hands. What Paul is saying is that you are spiritually circumcised. And this is really important in, in the language as it connects to the temple. Catch this. In the old temple, you couldn't get in if you weren't circumcised. You were shut out. We have a, a picture that shows uh, Herod's temple. So this court here, this outer court, was reserved for the Gentiles. So if you were a Gentile or you were uncircumcised, you were unclean, this is technically temple property, but it's outside the temple. The temple is within these walls. And then if you were an Israelite woman, you could get into this court here. If you were an Israelite man that was circumcised, you could get into this exclusive hallway here. So if you were a man, you could get here, here, and in the hallway. And then this inner court was reserved for the priests. This is where they would perform sacrifice and prayer rituals. And the Holy of Holies was tucked back in this back section of this taller room. So if you were uncircumcised, or if you were a woman, you had to watch all of the religious elites trail by you, walking closer to the physical presence of God. And they would look back at you and say, tough cookies. <laughs> We'll see you when we get back. And Jesus looks at this situation and says, I can fix that. By Jesus spiritually circumcising you, he removes every barrier to entry that you have to him. There are no more courts that split people up. Everyone can be brought near to the presence of God. But not only does this spiritual circumcision draw you close to him, it also severs your connection to sin. Your sin and all of its power and influence and eternal consequence in your life is literally cut off from you, circumcised from you, and you are free to enter into the presence of Jesus Christ completely clean. And to further illustrate this dual reality of the old being cut away and the new being placed in Jesus, Paul uses the illustration of baptism. 
You see, around this time, if it were possible, they preferred to baptize people in rivers. Because if you stand in a river, you get this clear sense. If you're, let's say you're waist high in a river, you get this very clear sense of the water moving past you. And so when they would baptize someone, they would dunk them under the water, they would bury them, and the old would be carried away. And the new person would be placed in position with Jesus. And that's, what, that's how Paul illustrates this point to us. This reality of baptism becomes this strong marker in our lives that helps us cling to Jesus and avoid false teaching. Because you get this practical visual, this tangible experience of God working in your life that you can then look back on and point at your baptism as a way to cling to Jesus and be reminded of the truth of what he's done in your life. You see, baptism for us is super important. If you are walking with Jesus and you have been spiritually baptized, but you haven't yet been physically baptized, I gotta be honest with you, God's word says that you are missing something that you're missing out on a key marker in your life of God working in you. And the good news is, that can be taken care of really easily. Baptism is quick and simple. I'll baptize you today, I live near a lake, I'm four minutes away. The question is, are you alive in Christ, or are you, are you dead in your sins? And that, that's what brings us to this next spot where, where Paul lays out one of the most powerful explanations of the gospel I've ever come across. Paul lets us know exactly how desperate our situation is. He says that we are dead in our sins. And I don't know if you know this, but if you're dead, you're pretty helpless. I can't think of someone that's more helpless than a dead person. And that's who we are in this scenario. We're the dead ones. But then God makes us alive. And I just wanna pause there because we come across these verses and we think, yeah, God made us alive. That's pretty cool. That's it? I feel like we've lost all wonder at the miracle that this really is, that you were dead, no pulse, no life, broken and hopeless, and God makes you live. But not only that, God makes you live in order to be with him. You are not only brought to life, you are brought to the fullness of what life is, by being brought to life to be with God forever. And the great thing about the gospel, about the good news, is that it keeps getting better. Paul says that not only are you alive with God, but that your record of debt is canceled. It's nailed to the cross. Anybody here ever have debt? I realize that sounds like a rhetorical question, but I want us to think about that. Credit card debt, car payments, mortgage, student loans. Student loans, those are coming up. <laughs> Now imagine, think about the debt that you've had, and imagine someone just randomly knocking on your door, and even though you've done nothing to deserve this, they let you know that they've paid off all of your debt. That'd be pretty sweet. The first debt that I ever got into was in high school. I know, it was early. <laughs> it was to my brother. I was low on cash as a high schooler, and my brother offered to give me $1,000 to go buy a car. This was back when $1,000 bought you a lot more car than it would today. And so I agreed. I took the $1,000. I told him I would pay him back. I would treat it as a loan. But I went from being a poor high school student to being a poor college student. I just couldn't scrape up the money to pay him back. Years went by, and I just couldn't pay him back. And so then out of nowhere, I'm in college, and my brother gives me a call, and he says, hey, I just want to let you know I'm going to cancel that debt. You don't have to pay me back. And at the time my brother called me, I had $12 in my bank account. I had $12 to my name. I was forgiven a debt that was literally impossible for me to pay back. It's laughable to try to pay back $1,000 with $12. And that is what God does with all of our debt. God doesn't cancel a portion of your debt to him. God cancels every record of debt that you have. You don't deserve it, but you get the phone call from God where he says, hey, just so you know, I've canceled your debt. You don't have to pay me back. I was so overwhelmed with thankfulness for being forgiven $1,000. And that's what Paul talks about. That symptom of abounding in thankfulness comes from this aspect. But guess what? It doesn't stop there. 
It keeps getting better. The gospel keeps getting better. Paul says that through your resurrection, through your forgiveness, that God has now disarmed the demonic forces, meaning that Satan and his demons are put to open shame. Now again, we read this and we tend to think, that's pretty cool. But I wanna pull back the historical context curtain, as it were, to see if we can uncover what Paul is really saying. You see, when, when people who lived under the rule of the Roman Empire would have heard Paul say these words, that God disarms his enemies, that he puts them to shame by triumphing over them in him, they would have immediately thought of a Roman triumph parade. What's a Roman triumph parade? Great question, I'm glad you asked. At the time, when Rome would engage in battle, after they had won the battle, they would take prisoners, and rather than executing those prisoners, they would take them back to Rome, and they would strip them of their weapons and their armor and often their clothing and force the enemy soldiers to walk through the streets of Rome powerless to demonstrate the total obliteration of Rome's enemies, to demonstrate that they're no longer a threat, and to demonstrate the might and power of the Roman Empire. And so by Paul saying this, Paul is saying that through the work of Jesus in your life, that God has stripped Satan and his demons of all of their power in the life of a Jesus follower. That all of the influence that they had over your life is removed. And not only that, but they are then paraded around in front of the kingdom of heaven to show that they are no longer a threat, that they are defeated, and that God is glorified. Understand this, that when you are in Christ, the sin that you currently wrestle with most is currently stripped of its power and is paraded around in front of God and you like a powerless insect. This was the reality in my life that I never understood because I believed lies from the enemy. I fell into false teaching. I believed a lie that said that I was still separated from God because I, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, was still sinning every day. And that's something that we don't like to talk about or acknowledge as followers of Jesus, right? We like to think that once we're saved, everything gets better. I wake up the next morning and I never have a negative thought about anybody else and I never lose my temper and I'm definitely never going to go back to the same sin that I've wrestled with for years. And so when I got saved, that's what I was waiting for. I was waiting for the moment where I would wake up and my desire to sin would be totally wiped away. And that moment didn't happen for me. I had a good first few weeks when I got saved. It was great. And then I sinned. And I kept sinning. And I kept sinning. And I couldn't talk to anyone at my church about it because the church was full of perfect people that never talk about the sins that they wrestle with. So am I gonna be the one Christian that says I'm wrestling with sin? No. <laughs> I kept that buried. And so my first few years as a follower of Jesus were spent wrestling with sin alone. And Satan used that time in my life to lie to me. And I began to believe it. I began to believe the lie that God regretted saving me. That God was just waiting for me to shape up and be a good Christian and then he would be pleased with me. Surely he looks at the other Christians who have their lives so nicely put together and he looks at them with such love and affection and he looks at me, the screw up, and thinks, Ugh, I don't even know if I want that guy here anymore. And then I began to leave the lie from there that God is not just disappointed in me, that God is ashamed of me. And when you start to believe that God is ashamed of you, you really start to doubt that God loves you. It is amazing how even for someone who has placed their faith in Christ, that believing a lie can suck the hope from your life. And you wanna know what snapped me back to the reality, to the truth of God's relationship with me? Love. Believing and seeing God's love for me. And you see it all through this passage. Look at all of the things that God does because he loves you. God roots you. 
God builds you up. God establishes you. God cuts you off from sin. He brings you close to him. He forgives your trespasses. He cancels your debt. He brings you to life with him, and he invites you to stand at his side as he establishes total victory over sin and death. The main point that Paul drives home in Colossians is not just Christ. It's Christ in you. You see, the worst sin that I was committing was refusing to believe Jesus and instead believing the lies of the enemy. And as I began to lean into the truth of God's word, the lies that I believed began to crumble. The lie that God regrets saving me, the truth is that God knew me and loved me while I was a sinner. That God knew what he was getting into and chose to save me anyway because he loves me. And the lie that God was ashamed of me If I'm honest, this is still a lie that I have trouble breaking off. It's like every time I sin, Satan is just waiting to whisper this to me. God's ashamed of you. And when that happens, we have a choice. Do we believe Jesus or do we believe demons? When you feel like God doesn't love you, that is a lie. Look at Colossians 2. Look, that, look and see that God loves you so much that he cancels your debt, forgives your every trespass, and invites you to stand in his presence and watch as Satan and his demons are paraded in front of you, defeated. Whenever Satan whispers a lie to you, it is always from a place of defeat and shame. And what comforts the follower of Jesus is that we know our place in this event. When you picture this heaven triumph parade, where these demonic forces are paraded powerless before God, where do you picture yourself? You see, the enemy wants us to think that every time we sin, we leave God's presence and we take our place in line, following them in shame. The truth is that because of Jesus, we are with Jesus and in Jesus. You are never placed in a position of shame in Christ. You are placed with Jesus at his side and your shame and your anxiety and your lust and your anger and your pride and your greed and any other sin that you wrestle with is powerless and it is paraded before you and God in shame to highlight that the enemy is no longer a threat and to demonstrate the holiness of God. That is the truth, and Paul brings all of this up in the context of false teaching because this is the takeaway that keeps us from falling to the lie of the enemy. It is Christ in you. It is seeing and believing that Christ has won the battle, he has won the war, he has chosen you to be his dwelling place so that you can be with him, and he has removed, circumcised, and cut off all sin so that you can be with him forever. Let the lie of the enemy begin to break off of you because you have seen your savior and nothing that the enemy says can ever overpower what Jesus says about you, that you are made alive to be with God forever. Amen? Let's pray. God, we just thank you for who you are. God, that your word is true. God, that your word stands. God, we just ask that you would help us to narrow our focus to you. God, this world is full of so many lies and distractions and hurts and pains that try to pull our attention away from you. So God, would you help us as a church to recognize the lies in our lives. God, I pray that you would speak to each person here, whether in the room or they're watching online, God, that you would speak to us and show us the lies that we believe. And God, that you would place your truth in us. God, that we would lean so deeply on your word that it would become easy to spot the counterfeit in our life. God, we trust that you are good God, we praise you for the work that you've done in our lives. God, that you draw us close to you. 
that you remove the barrier to entry, that you remove the sin and the power and the influence of sin in our lives. God, and you place us at your side. God, would you help us to keep that truth in our hearts, to know that you are not a God that regrets saving. God, that you desire to show mercy and you desire to show love. Help us be a people that spread that message to others. God, we ask all of this in your holy name. Amen.